So my name is Mickey Pardo. Um, I am a postdoc at Colorado State University in the U.S. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to, to you today about some of my current work on vocal labeling of individuals in African elephants. So one of the hallmarks of human language is using vocal labels or sounds that refer to objects or sometimes individuals. Um, in other words, words. That's what we call them in human language. But the evolutionary origins of vocal labeling are unclear. Um, so a lot of non-human animals, like these vermin monkeys here, famously use alarm calls or food calls to refer to certain types of predators or food. And we call these functionally referential calls, but it's debated and it seems increasingly, increasingly unlikely that these calls are really analogous in an evolutionary sense to the types of vocal labeling that occur in human language, in part because most alarm calls and food calls seem to be innate in their production, whereas a very important feature of human language is that the words have to be <coughs> Now, um, the reason why learning is so important is because if all of our words had the word innate, we'd be inherently limited in the number of objects that we could refer to. Um, so by using learned labels, we're able to have a much more flexible communication system. And uh, one spe very specific type of vocal label is personal names, which are essentially just labels in which the referent of the call is another individual rather than an object in the environment. And unlike most other types of functional referential calls, names by their very definition have to be learned because it's impossible for an individual to be born knowing the, the labels or names for all of its future social affiliates. So they could potentially be a more productive avenue to understand the evolution of vocal labeling than things like alarm calls, for example. Now, as I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience, um, one example of individual vocal labeling uh, in a non-human species is in bottlenose dolphins, which can address individual conspecifics by imitating the signature whistle of the intended receiver. And this is a type of vocal labeling, but it also differs from human vocal labeling in one important respect, and that's that the labels are inherently tied to the sounds made by the referent. So they're, they're iconic. They're, the label itself is an imitation of the receiver's vocal calls. And that contrasts with human language where most words are arbitrary. In other words, there's no inherent connection between the form of the word and the object or individual that it refers to. And this is important because if we were restricted to only communicating about things that made a unique sound that could be imitated, then that would significantly limit the number of things that we could refer to. So arbitrariness is kind of a seen as, as one of the key features of human language. And if we could identify arbitrary learned vocal labeling in a non-human species, this might have important implications for our understanding of how these types of behaviors can evolve. So this brings me to my species, which is the African elephant. And elephants are a great candidate species for investigating uh, individual vocal labeling in that they're known to be um, capable of vocal learning, but we have no idea how they use this ability in the wild. And they also have many lifelong differentiated relationships with a large number of other conspecifics, and they often communicate with one another at a distance when they're out of sight of one another. So being able to address calls to specific receivers um, could be particularly advantageous for them. The most common type of call the elephants produce is something called a rumble, which is produced in almost every behavioral context, and they're highly structurally variable. And um, these calls are partially infrasonic, and uh, they're, they're unique to the individual caller, but we don't know, and it's never been investigated, whether they might also contain information that's specific to the intended receiver. And this is what the part of the call that we can hear sounds like. So we set out to, I, uh, to address the three following research questions. One, do elephants vocally label individual conspecifics? Two, do different callers use the same label for the same receiver, or does every caller use a different label for the same receiver? And then finally, three, do callers label receivers by imitating the receiver's own individually specific call, um, or do they use some other mechanism, most likely 
uh, an arbitrary call to address uh, other the, to address the receiver. So we recorded calls in uh, Samburu and Buffalo Springs National Reserves in northern Kenya, and we also used some pre-existing recordings from uh, our collaborators who worked in Amboseli National Park in southern Kenya. And in total, we had 624 calls in the context of contact calling or leading, for which we were able to identify the caller and the receiver of the call, and that were of sufficient quality for acoustic analysis. And the reason we limited ourselves to contact and leading calls for this analysis is because most of the other contexts we were, where we were able to identify the intended receiver, um, and there was only one clear receiver, uh, were calls that were produced primarily between calves and their caregivers. And so that could potentially make it easier to determine the receiver simply because there, uh, a calf only has one other, for example. So uh, if the mother is calling and she's making a calf call, then we know who the receiver is just from that. And we identified the receiver of these contact leading calls using contextual cues. So for example, if there was a long distance contact call produced by somebody in the group, and there was only one individual lagging behind the group, then we assumed that that long distance contact call was intended for the one individual who was lagging. Or similarly, if two individuals were greeting one another, one of them made a greeting call, then we assumed that the recipient of that greeting call was the other individual participating in the greeting. And I don't have time to get into the details of the acoustic analysis here. Feel free to ask me about that later if you want to. Uh, but briefly, we measured 32 derived acoustic features uh, describing the spectral and temporal variation of calls. And then we ran two random forest models with six-fold cross-validation to predict receiver ID as a function of caller ID and the acoustic features. And the concept of cross-validation is <laughs> illustrated by this diagram here. Basically, each row in the diagram represents a single iteration. And I know there's only five iterations in this diagram, but we actually did six. And we divided the data set into six equal pieces. Um, and five of those pieces within each iteration were used as a training set, and then the fifth one, or the, the sixth one rather, um, using, which is represented as the blue squares in the diagram, was used as the test set, and each iteration used a different fold as the test set, so the data was trained and tested on the, the model was trained and tested on the full data set, um, and then we averaged the results across all of the folds. So the first model we ran, we stratified the cross-validation folds by caller ID and receiver ID, um, and this meant that every fold included to the extent that it was possible representatives of all the call and receiver pairs that, it, that occurred in the data set. So this meant that the data in the model was trained and tested on the same sets of call and receiver pairs. Uh, so in this model, we should be able to predict receiver ID regardless of whether call, different callers use the same label for the same receiver or whether they use different labels for the same receiver. As long as and if a single caller uses different labels for different receivers, you should be able to identify the receiver in this model. In the second model, we custom partitioned the cross-validation folds so that um, all calls from a given caller-receiver pair always occur together in the same fold. And this meant that the model was trained and tested on different sets of caller-receiver pairs. So in this model, we should only be able to predict receiver ID if different callers are using the same label for the same receiver. And uh, to determine if these models were performing better than, than we would expect by chance, um, when we first had to take into account the fact that each caller in the data set only called to a few different receivers. So it's theoretically possible um, if you have information on caller ID, which we know that the calls include the acoustic, acoustic cues to caller ID, uh, then it could be possible to predict the receiver ID simply by using acoustic cues to caller ID uh, alone. And so to, to make sure that the acoustic features actually added additional information beyond just caller ID, we ran each model 2,000 times with the acoustic features randomly permuted so that only caller ID was, caller ID was the only feature in the model that was informative. And then we, we looked at the null distribution cr created by these 2,000 models with permuted acoustic features using only color ID. And then we compared the actual classification accuracy from the model that included both color ID and the acoustic features to that null distribution. And in these graphs, the gray histograms, 
represent the null distributions of the proportion of calls classified correctly with all the features except for caller ID randomly permuted, and the red lines represent the actual classification accuracy with the original model using both the acoustic features and caller ID. So as you can see here, in the stratified model, uh, the model, uh, the acoustic features significantly improved the performance of the model over the null model, but this was not the case for the custom partition model. So this suggests that different callers are using different labels to address the same receiver, but within a given caller, you can predict the receiver ID just from the acoustic features. So there's one alternative explanation for our results that we wanted to rule out, and this is that perhaps, rather than being specific, to the individual receivers, or uh, the calls might be specific to the type of relationship between caller and receiver. So um, the model might theoretically be able to predict receiver ID just from acoustic information on caller ID and social relationship. So to do this, we categorized the um, relationship between every caller and receiver into 11 different categories. And then we calculated a proximity score for every possible pair of calls in the data set which is just a metric of similarity in terms of uh, how similar the calls are in terms of the acoustic features relevant to predicting receiver ID. And uh, then we looked at, the, we compared the proximity scores for different types of call pairs using gamma regression. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that pairs of calls with the same caller and same receiver were significantly more similar than pairs of calls with different callers and different receivers where the receivers had the same type of relationship to the callers. So this suggests that the calls are genuinely specific to the uh, individual receiver, not just to the type of relationship. But similarly to what we found before, there was no uh, calls from different callers to the same receiver were no more different than, or no more similar than calls from different callers to different receivers. Um, finally, uh, if elephants address receivers by imitating the call of the receiver's own calls, similar to how bottomless dolphins address one another, then calls from a given, then calls addressed to a given receiver should be more similar to that receiver's own calls than to the um, calls produced by other individuals. But we found that this was not the case, suggesting that elephants are not imitating the calls of the receiver, unlike dolphins. And finally, to determine if elephants could respond to these putative labels, we did a playback experiment where we played back calls um, from two calls from the same caller that were originally addressed to two different receivers to both receivers. We expected the receivers to respond more strongly to the call that was originally addressed to them than to a call from the same caller that was originally addressed to someone else. Um, and this is exactly what we found. Subjects approached the speaker more quickly in response to calls that were originally addressed to them. They vocalized more quickly in response to, to test playbacks and controls. And finally, they produced more calls in response to test playbacks and controls. So in conclusion, we found evidence that calls are specific to the individual receiver um, and that receivers can respond to this information. Um, we found uh, evidence that, that it seems that different callers are using different labels to address the same receiver. And finally, we found no evidence that elephants are imitating the receiver's calls, suggesting that they may be using arbitrary labels to address one another. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators and funders, um, and I imagine there's probably no time for questions, but if, there, if not, then feel free to find me afterwards.